without further ado, I'm going to introduce Joel Levine. Joel is a tour guide and board member at the Miami Design Preservation League. For over 30 years, he collected and restored radios and wind-up phonographs manufactured from 1900 to 1960, eventually acquiring more than 600 items. Has anyone seen uh, stuff from his collection? It's very cool, and we have some here at the museum. Um, while his original interest was in the technical design, Joel's interest evolved to appreciate Art Deco and mid-century modern cases and cabinets. Since retiring, Joel and his wife have had the opportunity to visit modern buildings in several countries. This presentation is a result of Joel's interest in both history and design. So please give a warm round of applause to Joel. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Uh, I know some of, some of you I don't know, I appreciate you all coming here. Uh, those of you that know me may know that my wife and I have an apartment uh, in Israel, and that's part of the interest that we have in doing a presentation on Israel. It's in a city called uh, Ashdod. Uh, Ashdod is on the uh, coast, the Mediterranean coast, about 25 miles south of uh, Tel Aviv. And even though it's 6,000 miles away, sometimes it's so familiar it almost feels like home. Because in, in uh, Ashdod, you have a beach called South Beach, you have an area called Aventura, and you have Miami Beach. <laughs> and these are actual photographs uh, of those areas. I think they have a Miami uh, uh, complex uh, in Ashdod. I have four objectives for the presentation I'm going to give you tonight. I'm going to do a very brief uh, review of modern architecture around the world, primarily in the pre-war period. Uh, and then I'm going to try to place both the Bauhaus and the Deco within what I call the family of modern uh, movements. Then we're going to look at the history of Tel Aviv and Miami Beach. There are some interesting similarities or reasons for that, and I'm going to talk about that uh, for a few minutes. Then we're going to look at the similarities of architecture uh, between the two cities. And then finally, I'm going to look at the goals that are uniquely Israeli in terms of preservation and then how those goals have an effect on the methods and the results as well. And we'll be looking at a lot of buildings uh, as we go through the process. So uh, I think everybody knows Frank Lloyd Wright. He didn't originate the phrase uh, form follows function, but he certainly made it uh, popular. And this is one of his iconic buildings. It's on my bucket list to see. I'm sure everybody knows falling water. Uh, uh, perhaps less well known is that there were, in, there were international, there were, excuse me, Maduran movements uh, in many places in the world. Uh, my wife and I had the uh, uh, pleasure of visiting Amsterdam, and there are actually uh, two different uh, Maduran movements. The uh, top building is a building called Het Ship, and that was from a, a, a movement to provide quality housing to industrial workers at the beginning of the century. That building was built in 1917. It's uh, uh, called brick expressionism, is one term for it. And to really appreciate it, you have to see it up front. It consists of brickwork of slightly different color, all arranged in different patterns. At the same time, they were providing housing for workers that really were living in hovels before. They have a very nice museum. Uh, my wife and I had the pleasure of spending an afternoon with the director there who was thrilled to have somebody visiting from the world famous uh, Miami Beach uh, MDPL. She was very familiar with us. Okay. Another location, now we didn't see this building but I'm, I'm familiar with it, another movement was called Der Stiel. Uh, and the lower building is the Ridwald Schroeder House, which was another early attempt to provide a worker house. Uh, 1924, it was in a different city, so I haven't seen it. So you can see just in this one country there were a couple of movements, okay? Less known for many people is in the Soviet Union. This is a building, this is a computer reconstruction of a 1930 building uh, called, uh, called the Narkopin building. Le Corbusier said that this building was an inspiration to him. He saw it before uh, he built his famous building. Unfortunately, this is not what it looks like. This is what it looks like today. Okay, and uh, my wife and I visited, we had been off the internet, we were told, or we believed that it was an abandoned building, and we got there, it was a hub of activity. We asked somebody, what's going on in the building? He says, I don't know, and walked away. Uh -huh. So we knocked on the door, and, and 
a, 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 a squat, dangerous little guy came out, looked just like this, <laughs> and chased us away. We nicknamed him Boris and decided that we weren't going to press our luck in the Soviet Union. Uh, of course, Le Corbusier, uh, uh, this is, uh, it's got a clip of this is Villa Savoy, the name of this building, okay, 1932, uh, and uh, uh, considered a very significant building. Uh, he had a number of principles, he called them points. Uh, you can see some of them here. Uh, Le Corbusier uh, had a concept that you should build, you should separate the exterior from the interior. So he built the building on a platform, and then the interior had no connection to the exterior, but he liked even lighting, so we had ribbon windows. And the ribbon windows you're going to see in other buildings. That's a feature that uh, I think a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of buildings later uh, adapted. Uh, in Germany, you had the Bauhaus movement. This was also a social movement as well as a uh, construction movement. Started in 1919, continued until 1933 when the Nazis shut it down. The Nazis shut it down because they didn't approve of modern architecture. And the purpose of the Bauhaus movement was, one, to provide high quality housing to, uh, to low income workers, very similar to what we uh, saw in Amsterdam. And it was also intended to reinfuse craftsmanship into the worker process. Uh, I often make references to it on tours when I'm at the Victor Hotel. Because if you look at the Victor Hotel, if you're familiar with that building, it really looks like a Bauhaus building. If I have Germans on the tour, I always talk about uh, uh, Bauhaus. And they always like to hear that. Uh, in 1932, there was an exhibit at the Modern Museum of Modern Art about modern architecture, and it was a retrospective. So they were looking at some of the buildings that um, we just, uh, we looked at. And in fact, there's Villa Savoy right in the uh, center uh, of, uh, of this exhibit. What's interesting about this exhibit is that it's primarily about architecture that came to be, that was known up until that time as Bauhaus. But the uh, originators of this exhibit, Hitchcock and Johnson, decided to change the name of that architecture from Bauhaus to International. And the re their reasoning for ch making that change is that they said this is an architecture that can be used anywhere in the world as long as you adapt it to the circumstances of, uh, of the country that you're, uh, you're building in. What's, uh, what's, it, there's a kind of an irony in all of this. Uh, I don't know if, if you're familiar with this book. I hesitated to, uh, to recommend it because Tom Wolfe is a, well, he's a racist, he's an anti-Semite. But when I read up more about him, it turns out I don't think he likes anybody. Okay. Uh, and it really comes out. I read this book in the early 80s, I believe, when he first published it. And I reread it for this presentation. Uh, and his information is interesting, but his, his attitude is sneering. He's sneering at these architects. And my feeling was, what did you ever build that you can sneer at these people and laugh at? It? But this was what his point is. His point was that the Bauhaus architects started out with the intention of building worker housing, and what they ended up with was building skyscrapers for corporate headquarters. Okay? Uh, uh, and this particular building, this is the Seagrams building, 1958. This is the first all glass tower. This was the most expensive building ever built in New York City. Okay, the architects included uh, Philip Johnson, who worked on that exhibit in 1932, and it also included Mai van der Rohe from the, uh, from the uh, Bauhaus School in Germany. Uh, the, uh, ar the major Bauhaus architects, almost none of whom were Jewish, uh, left Europe, left uh, first Germany and then Europe when the, uh, when the Nazis rose. And most of them landed in the United States, a few in Britain as well. So this was the most expensive building that was ever built up until uh, its time. And it's funny the way you get coincidences. So I really had, had forgotten about this uh, until I had read the, uh, the Tom Wolfe book again. And uh, the next night, I also had an interest in movies. And I was, my wife and I were watching a movie called The Best of Everything. And the opening scene in the film, The Best of Everything, is about working women in Manhattan in 1959, one year after this building is built. And the very opening scene shows a woman holding an advertisement. It says, "The best of, you deserve the best of everything, and she's entering this building. That was Paul Apprentice. That's Paul Apprentice. So, so, the so it just shows you how that building was using architecture to, to send you a message 
a message that most people would have forgotten today, because today that's not a, uh, a remarkable building. But it was a remarkable building when it was built. Okay? And then, of course, we know about our dead this, These are, by the way, the frozen fountains, the elusive frozen fountains. And I call them elusive because if you look at the, uh, the, uh, the posters uh, from that uh, exhibit that are on the wall here, none of them show a frozen fountain. But we always associate the frozen fountain with the 1925 uh, Arts Decorative show. There are actually two sets of frozen fountains in, the, uh, in this picture. There's uh, metal grill work right over here. That's uh, Edgar Brandt. And then up on the, the little columns, this was one of the gates to enter that exhibit. And in the entrance column, you have in glass uh, these uh, frozen fountains. Okay, and this is a, uh, uh, an artist by the name of René Levy. So though that's the origin of the frozen fountain. Well, we know, of course, that, that Art Deco is all over the world. These are famous places, Napier. Uh, Paris is famous for it, New York. Perhaps a little less known is uh, Moscow. I don't know if anybody is aware, but there are seven buildings like this. Seven, uh, uh, the locals call them Stalin skyscrapers. But the tour guides call it the Seven Sisters because they want to give it a prettier name. And this particular building is a building that Barbara and I were in. We just stumbled upon this. We went to Moscow and we didn't know anything about it. We never had any idea that there was something that was considered Art Deco in Moscow. This is a restored hotel. It's magnificent on the inside. Uh, uh, it also has a mini, uh, a mini uh, Russia, a mini Moscow exhibit. So, uh, which of all places was originally in Long Island. Uh, just a few miles from where we lived for 20 years. Uh, and yet we never knew it was there, okay? And of course, our own Miami Beach. So, so uh, it's just doing this little survey, I wanted you to see that the, there were many, many modern movements that they were expressed in different ways in different countries, uh, and that the best way to think about the relationship between Art Deco and Bauhaus is that they were cousins, okay, expressing some of the same principles, but also expressing some different interests as well. Uh, Tel Aviv and Miami Beach, two interesting cities. They have a lot of similarities. Well, of course, they're both beach cities. If you've ever seen Tel Aviv, and it's a long uh, coast, uh, six or seven miles long, comparable to Miami Beach. It's not an island, but it is a uh, beach city. Climate-wise, it's also a warm city. Uh, Miami Beach is warmer. In the summer, they both have an average high of about 90. Uh, in the winter, uh, Tel Aviv is about 75, uh, excuse me, Miami Beach is 75, and Tel Aviv is a little cooler at an average height of about 65, so it's a little cooler in the, uh, uh, in the winter. Very different pattern of rain. Uh, in Israel, it doesn't rain from April to October. So there's about 20, at all, so there's been about 20 inches of rain in the winter. So from October to April, Tel Aviv will get about 20 inches of rain. Of course, here in Miami, we get about 60 inches of rain, and we seem to get a whole lot of it in August and July. Uh, August alone, we can get 8 to 10 inches of rain, about half of what Tel Aviv gets in a, uh, a year. Both of these cities were also outgrowths of existing cities, so for very different reasons. We know Miami Beach, of course, is an outgrowth of the city of Miami. Uh, after the train came to Miami, there was an opportunity to further develop this area. Uh, excuse me. Tel Aviv is an outgrowth of a city called Yaffa, which is one of the oldest cities in the world, four or 5,000 years old. It was a walled city. All of the major cities in what was then called Palestine <coughs> were walled, walled cities until 1900. And what that means is they actually had a wall around them, and they had a gate, and when it turned dark, they locked the gate, and if you were on the outside, you were out of luck, because there were bandits that were liable to, uh, to, uh, to attack you. But by 1900, uh, because of immigration, the city just couldn't stay within the walls anymore. And there was a call to build uh, suburbs outside of the walls of, uh, of uh, Yaffa. Another similarity is that they have uh, beachfront promenades, both cities. But on this score, Tel Aviv has it hands over uh, Miami Beach. This promenade uh, runs the length of the city and it connects to promenades north of the city and south of the city, so it runs for 15 or 20 miles. Also, there are no private buildings on the sand right up to the, uh, right up to the uh, 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 beach. 
So all those buildings you see in the back, they're hotels, they're restaurants. They are buildings that have a public purpose. They're privately owned, but they have a, a, publicly, a public purpose. You don't have what you have here, which is condominiums, which live, which control the beach. Uh, even if they don't control the beachfront entirely, they have uh, uh, control of a lot of the beach. And I'm a little guilty because I live in one of those, so I'm a hypocrite. But I understand the public policy advantage of having an open beach. And they have a wonderful promenade that runs a whole distance. Also, they don't have the storm activity that we do, so they don't have to have the sand dunes for protection. Uh, so the beach is completely open. And this, is, this beach is, is active 24 hours a day. You can go there at 2 in the morning. People will be walking on the beach, will be bicycling. It's a very, very active part of the city and a very, very safe part of the city. Okay? They also, the two cities were also founded in roughly the same period. Now, a founding year is somewhat arbitrary. And I say it's arbitrary because there are really always events that are occurring before that. But at some point, there's a critical mass of growth. And that is the point at which somebody says that was when the city was founded. So Tel Aviv is generally considered to be 1909. And Miami Beach, sometimes they use the year 1915 when it became a town, sometimes 1917 when it became a city. But basically, both of these areas developed significantly in the second uh, decade of the uh, 20th century. This is considered the founding moment for Tel Aviv, uh, standing on a sand dune about uh, a mile and a half from Yaffa. Uh, there was a lottery for the first building lots. Uh, this is 1909, same location, about two years later. Uh, that building in the center is the water tower, uh, uh, because you couldn't have a town without water, and they had to build a water tower. Same location. Uh, 1913, but the, this picture is taken from the water tower, so it's the other end of the street. This is a street if you've ever been to Israel, Rothschild Boulevard, okay, if anybody has been there. So this became the center of the uh, city. This is 1913, uh, and you can see the city was starting to uh, develop uh, rapidly. This is that same location today. The water tower, of course, isn't there, but that water, uh, uh, that little pool marks the spot where the water tower was uh, uh, previously. And the beautiful woman in the picture is my wife, Barbara. Okay, I have to say, uh, I, have to, I have to credit her for helping me a great deal with the uh, research for this, uh, for this project. And just to show you how perfect she is, she even color coordinated her blouse with the water that day. I mean, is, that, is that terrific or what? Okay. So, you know, Tel Aviv is a modern city using only the most modern building techniques. Okay. And you can see it was built up with only the most pleasant working conditions for everybody. Okay. Needless to say, this was a desert outpost and people worked very, very hard to, uh, to build a city under those conditions. Uh, it was laid out according to the plan of a uh, Scottish uh, landscape uh, architect, uh, and it was laid out as a garden city. Uh, so what you have in Tel Aviv is you have some white boulevards, and then as you go off the boulevards, you have a number of smaller red buildings. The height limit was originally four stories. There's spaces between all the buildings. So this is, this is actually downtown Tel Aviv. You go one block off the main street, you get a street like this. Okay, another similarity that we all know about is the population. Not going to come as a surprise to anybody that most of the residents in Tel Aviv are, are Jewish. Uh, and of course, uh, Miami Beach at one time was 60 or 70 percent uh, uh, Jewish. This is a short clip from a film, uh, 1977 uh, Bloody Sunday, uh, Black Sunday. Black Sunday. And it's a, it's, there's a, there's a, unfortunately, I don't have the sound working but it's a visual joke or an auditory joke. The man in the background is chasing, a, uh, it's a, a Mossad agent, chasing a Palestinian terrorist through a group of elderly Jews singing the Israeli national anthem. And this is on Miami Beach. This, by the way, this scene takes place exactly next door to where we are right now. And if I had showed you the whole scene, this building is in the scene, okay? It's a very funny scene to watch. And this will be captured the Jewish presence, because they were making a joke that that uh, that that they were they were having this uh, this battle in the middle of a Jewish town. Another similarity, of course, is that both towns are uh, are gay friendly. Uh, a reason I, I I'm not sure, 
But both cities are known to be gay friendly. Tel Aviv is a very secular city. There's a saying in Israel, uh, Haifa works, Jerusalem uh, prays, and Tel Aviv plays. So uh, Tel Aviv is a very secular city. Uh, and this was from uh, the a newspaper last year that Tel Aviv was named the top city for uh, uh, pride. I know that in gay magazines it's been uh, yeah, and I've read that, that it's, uh, it's won awards in gay magazines as a place to, uh, to, uh, to visit. It's a very, you know, Israel is a land of contrasts. Uh, and one of the contrasts is when you're in a secular city, you, you could be in a city that uh, is anywhere in the world. Uh, uh, and their attitude is, you know, do what you have to do. Do what you want to. Architecture, because that's what you hear to hear about. Uh, prior to 1920, they had a vernacular architecture as well. Vernacular, if you're not familiar with the term, is the type of architecture that non-professionals build using the local materials that they have available. So here in Miami Beach, we have a few buildings that have survived from the vernacular period, uh, not too many. There are quite a few in, uh, in Tel Aviv. This particular building was actually built by German Christians. I believe it's about 1870 or 1880. You can see it has some similarities to some of our coral houses. It has a red tile roof that is a, a, a tile roof. It's not a barrel, but it's a tile. Okay, the limestone, it's a local limestone. It's cut, but it's a local limestone. Uh, so they were using the local material, very sturdy. This is a, over 150, about 150 years old, this building. The great irony of it is this was all, these were originally German farmers. And by the 1930s, they aligned themselves with the Nazi movement. When the war began in 1939, this was a Nazi enclave in the middle of Tel Aviv in 1939. When the World War II began, uh, Britain deported all of the German nationals that were living in, uh, in uh, what was then Palestine and took up and nationalized their land. And the land where this is became the equivalent of the Pentagon, first for the uh, British and then for the Israelis uh, after World War II. Uh, recently, the Israeli army has started to move down south. All of this land is being freed up. Some of it is being developed as restaurants, museums, and other is just being freed up for, uh, for modern buildings. Uh, you can see a tower in the back. So here's a building from a period that's called eclectic, 1920 to 1926. Now, if you've seen our Mediterranean revival here, you'll see some features that are pretty common in this building. You'll see that, for example, uh, this building uh, has uh, columns in it, okay? It has arched uh, doorways and windows. It has a balcony. It has some metal work, uh, uh, tile roof. Uh, it has this corner piece called coin, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. You see that in some of the Mediterranean buildings, okay? Now, if I saw this building and people didn't tell me where it was, I would probably guess it's, I don't know, it could be downtown Miami. I wouldn't think it's Miami Beach, okay? But with that tower in the background, it could, it could, be, uh, it could be somewhere in Miami. The only proof that it isn't in Miami is that it's a little hard for you to see it, but right over here is the Hebrew word vilanot, which means uh, 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 blinds, if there's a blind store. Okay. Otherwise, that building could easily be uh, be somewhere in uh, uh, in, uh, in Florida. Uh, and this style is called eclectic. It ran from 1920 to 1926, pretty much the same period that ours did too. And we know that in 1926 that period came to an end because uh, Miami Beach had a very big hurricane. Uh, uh, Israel doesn't get hurricanes. They don't have the same weather patterns that we have here. But their style did come to an end in 1926 as well. So I'm just comparing it for a moment to, uh, this is the, the Bonaire, it's a block from here, it's on 11th Street, okay? And again, you see many of the same uh, features, the curved uh, arches, uh, the doors and the windows, the metalwork. This one actually has a phony balcony. You have some columns, these are twisted. If you can look at the roof, you see that the roof is a barrel roof, a red tile roof. Many of the same features. But the reason that the Israeli uh, eclectic style came to an end in 1926. It had nothing to do with the weather, had to do everything with the economy. A lot of the immigrants that were coming in the 20s were from Poland, and in 1926 there was a uh, re-evaluation of the Polish currency, and there was a depression. And construction stopped for a couple of years, then like everywhere in the world, the depression started in 1929, 
and construction was on hold. Now, there's a reason why there's a similarity between the two styles. They both owe themselves to the same exhibit. And this is the 1915 San Diego exhibit. And this exhibit is the originator of the style that we call Mediterranean Revival and that they're calling eclectic. It actually is the same style because they're, the, the architects and the historians trace it to the same, uh, to the same uh, exhibit. And these exhibits were very influential. Uh, I grew up on World's Fair and, you know, it was really more like a large-scale carnival. But in the early part of the century, particularly before you had movies, you had television, in 1915 you didn't even have radio yet. Radio doesn't come in until the 1920s. So at that time of the world, at that time of history, these exhibits were a major method for uh, transmitting information. Uh, a lot of inventions, the electric light was introduced this way, electric motors were introduced this way, and at this point, architecture. We know about it, of course, 1925, there's the Art Decoratif uh, show in Paris, which is 10 years later after the war, which is the show that introduced the world uh, to, uh, to Art Deco. Here are some more buildings from that style, and you know, again, you're looking at the skyscraper in the background, but if not for that, uh, you know, this, these could be in Miami. This building, this is almost, this, this looks like it has some, some transitional elements, it has some curvature in it, but again, many of the Mediterranean revival, or eclectic revival, there's a very nice building, private residence, okay? Now here are two buildings. Can anyone guess which one is in Miami Beach and which one is in uh, uh, Tel Aviv? The one on the right is in Miami. The one in the right is in Miami, and the one on the left that says uh, Townhouse Hotel, that's in Israel, okay? But the buildings bear a certain resemblance to each other. 1932, uh, Israel had a revival. Uh, this is pre prior to the Nazi period. Nazis come to power in 1933. Okay, this has nothing to do with the Nazis. Uh, there's an economic uh, upkeep. Uh, immigration starts again. And Tel Aviv has a short period that is actually called Art Deco. Okay, so this is a building from Tel Aviv. This feature in the center is called a thermometer. So the uh, thermometer window, and it was very common in these buildings to put the staircase in the front and to uh, light, up, light it up with natural light during the day and to light it up, of course, with electric lights uh, at night. So anyone that's familiar with Art Deco can see the features. It has a little zigzag. Uh, uh, it's symmetrical. It looks very much like an Art Deco building. Okay, uh, many of these buildings have had additions. I'm going to talk to you about that in a minute, but here's another building. Okay, now here's a building that's almost transitioning and starting to get a little curve. You'll notice it also has the thermometer. I'm going to show you this building at night uh, at the end of the presentation. Because these buildings, when they're lit up, uh, really show well at night. Okay, and here's, uh, here's another building, but it's at the beginning of the uh, Bauhaus period. And there's a misconception that I have actually seen in Israeli newspapers, okay? Now, the Bauhaus period starts in 1934. So people have put two and two together and gotten six. They said, well, it started in 1934. The Nazis rose to power in 1933. The Nazis created refugee okay. So let me start with Eric Mendelssohn. Eric Mendelssohn was a very important architect of modern. He wasn't technically part of the Bauhaus school, but he was a collaborator with them. He taught there on occasion. Uh, he put out publications with them, and he's considered the father of uh, Streamline Modern. So these are his first two buildings in Berlin, and these are considered to be the first two Streamline buildings in the world, and the Bauhaus movement uh, borrowed heavily from uh, his style. Eric Mendelssohn uh, did come to Israel in 1933. Uh, Nazis, uh, Hitler is appointed chancellor, January of 33, and within six months, Mendelssohn was, uh, had offices in uh, London and Tel Aviv. But Mendelssohn never built a single building in Tel Aviv that I can, I can find. And there's a couple of reasons for that. This particular building is a Mendelssohn building. It's the uh, uh, house for uh, Weissman, uh, Chaim Weissman, who was the uh, head of the Zionist movement at that time, later the first president of Israel when it was a ceremonial uh, position. Uh, he did do this building. He also designed the Hadassah Hospital in Jerusalem. Uh, but he never built a building in uh, Tel Aviv. And in fact, 
he didn't even approve of the build of the Bauhaus building that were being built. If you look at this building, it has Medi it has Middle Eastern elements in it, and he felt that taking the Bauhaus uh, design and sitting it into the Middle East was not authentic. And then if you were going to be building in the Middle East, you needed to come up with an architecture that was more authentic uh, to that uh, to that area. Where, where was, is the previous building? Huh? Where is the previous building? Oh, that's where on the uh, grounds of the uh, Weizmann Institute in Rahabalt. Okay, so the Weizmann Institute is a uh, university and research center. It's uh, really internationally known. Uh, met quite a few Nobel Prize winners in that. And uh, it's named after Chaim Weizmann. He was himself a scientist. Chaim Weizmann's influence in, in the British is that during World War II, he came up with a chemical process that, uh, excuse me, during World War I, he came up with a chemical process that permitted the uh, British to continue to make munitions using chemicals that were not easily readily available to them. So to the British, he was a great hero, and he was a chemist. When he came to Israel, he set up a science institute, the Weizmann Institute, and it's not clear whether he ever lived in this house or whether it was just a, an honorary house. Today, it's a museum, uh, uh, and actually, when we have our apartment in Ashdod, it's only about 20 minutes away. Yeah. Uh, okay, so just to prove the point that, that, that the architects were not refugees, this is a list of the architects that did design buildings. I put this list together, okay? And you're gonna take my word for it, but if you look at this list, okay, uh, uh, almost all of the architects were either native or they were immigrants who emigrated prior to 1933, okay? Also, you'll see that of all these architects, only two of them actually trained in the Bauhaus School. Uh, and only one of those architects came in 1933, Mr. Lee Kowski. Shimon Leokowski, he actually was a refugee from the Nazis, but he didn't train in the Bauhaus school, he trained in, uh, in Zurich. So none of these people trained, now I'm not saying that they weren't influenced by the Bauhaus style, they were aware of it and they were building in that style, but none of these people were refugees from the Nazis. They were people that had, almost without exception, already decided to make their, their life in Palestine and to build their buildings and to do their life's work there, and they were modernists. They wanted to know what was going on in the world and they wanted to build in the modern style. Okay. And there's another reason also why they, uh, very few of them went to the Bauhaus school. The Bauhaus school was primarily a school of design and most of these other schools, Ghent, Darsh, Darmstadt, St. Petersburg, they were schools of design and engineering. And the architects in Israel wanted to have the dual skill of both engineering the building and designing the building. The Bauhaus School didn't have uh, an engineering department. So to get the education that they want, wanted, they had to go to other schools. Uh, uh, this is uh, one of the uh, early uh, Bauhaus buildings, okay? Now if you'll notice, it has a little ledge on it, okay? Does that ledge look familiar? Okay, the Hebrew word for it is gevot. Uh, that translates as eyebrow. Uh, so uh, eyebrows were known to these, uh, to these architects and it is one of the features. Uh, that's why I always talk about it as a family of movement. Architects are always looking at what other architects are doing and they're borrowing ideas and they're borrowing concepts. Uh, here's a building that's probably a little more traditionally a Bauhaus. Unlike the uh, 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 Art Deco, the Bauhaus uh, did not like symmetry. They preferred to have asymmetry. If you notice the very long windows, this, these are almost ribbon windows, not quite, but there's a lot of window space uh, in these uh, buildings. Also, you'll notice that the windows are often recessed. This has kind of like mini eyebrows, but they're recessed for the same reason that we have to, have to put shade on a window. You're in a hot climate with a lot of sun. It's actually a little warmer than our climate, and uh, you want to you wanna cool the buildings. They're white for the same reason. Our buildings were originally white, because that's one of the ways in which you can, uh, you can uh, naturally cool it, keep a building cool by keeping it white. The colorization, as we all know, came much later uh, and for different reasons. But these buildings were almost all built white and the nickname for Tel Aviv is the White City. Okay, now there's another version of the thermometer, uh, a window, that's also a, uh, a, uh, a staircase. But in here you see one of the problems that uh, Israel has had with these buildings, for many years there were no standards because they weren't considering this something to save. 
So you can see people were starting to enclose their balconies to get more space, but there was no standard to do it. Okay, we're going to see this in some other buildings as well. So the building started to have a very mishmash and a very shabby appearance because people did whatever they want. Okay, here's a building that is exactly original and has been restored to the way it was. Okay, beautiful buildings of private residence. These are all in Tel Aviv. Okay, here's another building uh, that's been restored. Uh, we're going to talk about this building probably a little later. Okay, another building on a major street. You're going to notice, and I'm going to come back to it, some of these have extra floors. Remember what I told you, the original buildings, the height limit was four floors. So anytime you see more than four floors, you know that somebody has added a floor or more. Okay? Another variation, this building, is it Art Deco, is it Bauhaus, it's got elements of both. Okay, here's a building, very, very Art Deco-ish uh, uh, as well. Here's a building, you can see floors have been added to it. Uh, it's very streamlined. And here's a very sad building. If I had the money, I would buy this building. And the reason it's a sad building, not surprisingly, this is called the ship. The nickname of it is the ship, okay? And it, it, it has the misfortune of being in the wrong neighborhood, okay? The other buildings that we're looking at are in desirable residential areas, and sooner or later, they're gonna be renovated, and I'll tell you how they're gonna be renovated. But they're all gonna be renovated. This building is in a, is in a sorry industrial zone, and it's, a, it's an orphan building. Uh, uh, so even though it's pretty much original, it, 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 it's very sad looking. Uh, and by the way, I have to tell you, this picture was literally taken as I was driving. Tel Aviv is a, uh, is a tough city to, uh, to drive around, uh, and it was very tough last summer when I was taking these pictures. Very tough because they're putting in a, uh, uh, a rail system, so the, the, the streets are all being uh, uh, torn up. And there's, and there's no place on those streets where you can just pull over. You have to go into, into a parking lot. So just to take a picture, okay, was an ordeal, okay, to find a parking space. And unfortunately, at the time, I had bronchitis, and I just didn't have the energy in 90-degree weather to walk the miles around, uh, around Tel Aviv. Uh, so some of these pictures were just taken from my uh, car. Here's a building. It had a renovation, but it's, I think it's, it's at least due for another paint job, a nice house. Okay, here, you can really see here, look what, look what they did with those, uh, those balconies, it's terrible, I mean, look at it, it's, it's, it's ugly, okay, and that wouldn't be allowed today, but it's only going to change when the building gets renovated, okay, there's no requirement that a building has to be renovated, but if you're going to get, it's like here, if you're going to get a building permit, you've got to do it right, but if you don't get a building permit, a lot can stay the way it was when we grandfathered in, okay, uh, you see a, uh, uh, Round balconies, those rails that are all original, that's very nice. So this building has all its original detail, okay? Now here's a building, I had a devil of a time. Right across the street, we parked somewhere illegally, okay, where we could keep an eye on the car, okay? And the whole street was under construction, okay? I could not get a decent picture, so I took a picture out of the car. That's what it really looks like. It's a beautiful building if you look at it from the right angle, but I wasn't able to get the right angle. Okay, more streamlined buildings. This is out of a book as well. Okay, this is a renovated building. Renovated building, okay. And then the, the center of town is an area called Dieselgorf Square. Okay, this was built in the 30s. I would gather that this picture was probably the late 30s. Okay, it may even be a Jewish holiday because there were very few cars on the road. Okay, uh, uh, and this was the, the center of uh, Tel Aviv. It has all these uh, rounded buildings. That, that are shaped to the square. But in the 70s, the late 60s, early 70s, this plaza was elevated to improve the traffic flow and it blocked the view of the buildings, okay? Uh, it was widely considered to be a disaster. So that complex has just been taken down. So when I was there last summer, this is what it looked like. It's in the middle of all the construction work. So I couldn't give you a good picture of what it's going to look like. But all the buildings in that circle are being uh, beautifully renovated. One of them is a former, if you go to Tel Aviv and you want a nice hotel to stay at, one of them is a former uh, movie theater called the uh, Cinema. Today it's called the Cinema uh, Hotel. And it's a beautiful renovation. It's a modestly priced hotel. And it's also like a, an open museum. They preserve all the movie equipment and the posters 
and I stumbled on it, to tell you the truth. We didn't know about it. We walked in, and nobody stopped us. We left, we left our bags in, in the reception area, and we just walked up and down the corridors. They had movie equipment. They had projectors. They had all the artifacts from the movie theaters that were there, and nobody stopped us from walking around. So we had a good time. Uh, uh, but this area, I hope, will be restored to what it looked like originally. Okay, and here's an interesting building. Okay, uh, uh, you can see it's uh, uh, got an interesting uh, uh, shape to it. Okay, but take a look at the name. Okay, you see what it says, the Watchtower? Okay, now in case you think that that's just a coincidence, the Hebrew word, a mitzvah, is the Hebrew word for a watchtower. So in case you think that uh, it's a coincidence, you actually look over here, it says jw.org. This is the uh, Tel Aviv headquarters for Jehovah's Witnesses. Okay, so my conclusion is some things really are international. Okay, and certainly this movement is. Now they also have a Bauhaus Center, much as we have an Art Deco Center, and it's a little bit like a, a deja vu. You walk in there, and what do they have? They have a shop so they can sell you things. You go upstairs, there's a museum. Our museum is much better. Okay, and I say that uh, objectively. They have tours of the area at 10.30, okay, in English. Does that sound familiar? Okay, uh, so I'm telling you, it's a little bit like deja vu. There are so, so many similarities. Uh, uh, this is right on a main street, okay? The tour is a very informative tour, okay? You walk through the area, you get to see quite an interesting sampling of buildings and to get some of the history, okay? I have to tell you, by the way, that uh, Tel Aviv was built as a worker's neighborhood. That's another reason why Mendelssohn didn't build here. Mendelssohn was associated with a uh, uh, with the right wing of the Zionist movement, the uh, the, the the finances, the uh, the wealthier people, and Tel Aviv was a working class city. He didn't want to build houses for ordinary people. He only wanted to build houses and buildings that were important because he was important. Okay, but the architects that were building here were very similar to the architects that were that were building in uh, in the Netherlands. They were trying to build nice houses for people that didn't have a lot of money, but they wanted the house to be bright, they wanted them to have a nice view, they wanted them to have a terrace if possible. Uh, so again, they had similar objectives, and the objectives lined up with the original objectives of, of the Bauhaus movement, houses for workers, okay? Now, Israel has got a lot of history, okay? Uh, this is the earliest, oldest exhibit, or, or exhibit of the oldest period, okay? Uh, in Israel, in the Carmel Mountains, our Cro-Magnon ancestors met our Neanderthal ancestors, okay? They met them about 40,000 years ago, and uh, from that time going forward, uh, the Neanderthal starts to disappear. Their habitat goes further north, and their numbers start to dis uh, disappear. This is an actual cave. This is a museum cave. You climb up a little hill, and it's a reconstructed site of what the exhibit, what the uh, uh, house would have looked like, the cave house would have looked like 40,000 BCE before the Common Era, uh, which would be the same as BC. Uh, in Israel, they use the term BCE. Uh, so I, I'd say that's pretty far back in history. An interesting thing if you get there to walk, to, uh, walk up this hill and to see this reconstruction of uh, ancient life, okay? You have events there, this is a, uh, a building that's known as the uh, Synagogue of Jesus in a town called Capernaum. If you go to the Christian Bible, there are events that are told, and those events can actually be placed in this building. Okay, uh, this is it's a historical event and a historical site that you can you can actually tie up the place. Okay, and this is a uh, an archaeology site. You enter it, you can walk around it uh, quite freely. Okay, everybody knows about the Temple Mount. Uh, and the, uh, the alternating uh, claims. Uh, this was built in the time of uh, uh, King Herod, uh, uh, just around the time of uh, uh, the Christian period as well. Okay, and it was uh, the uh, temple, was the second temple, two temples were on the site, second one was destroyed in 70 uh, uh, in the Common Era. There are a lot of Roman ruins. This is a Roman aqueduct. Uh, uh, and the Romans left uh, water systems all over the country, most of them have decayed. The water system that provides the uh, Temple Mount that I just showed you is the uh, original 2,000-year-old uh, Roman uh, water system. It's still in use. 
It's not feeding the whole city. It only feeds the Temple Mount today, but it's the same water system that the Romans had 2,000 years ago. It's been kept up. Okay? Uh, so in Israel, so when Israel was founded, they wrote an antiquities law, and they protected buildings that were built before 1700. Because anything after 1700 just seemed too modern to be bothered with. Okay? So Israel had what I call a Penn Station moment. Okay? And what was the Penn Station moment? This building, the Herzliya Gymnasium, the first high school in Israel, built 1909. Okay, again, by 1960, it was taking up prime real estate in the middle of the city, and people wanted the land. Okay, and uh, there was no preservation movement to protect it, so this building was uh, knocked down. Okay, this is the scene, this is what it looked like in context, about probably around World War I. I don't have an exact year for this picture. This is what it looks like today. That building was put up, that's the first skyscraper in the Middle East, it was put up in 19. 64. Another interesting thing is we were parking in the basement of that building because it had a big parking lot, and it turns out there's a wonderful museum of the history of Tel Aviv architecture that's free right in that uh, right in that building. We just stumbled on it uh, uh, that particular day. So as a result of the destruction of this building, uh, a preservation movement uh, uh, started up. Okay, this is the symbol. Now do you notice a certain similarity. It's a building that's destroyed, just like our symbol is a building that's destroyed, uh, the New Yorker Hotel. The symbol of this preservation of society uh, is the Herzliya Gymnasium, a building that has been lost. And the name of that uh, organization translates as the Society for the Profe Protection of Historical Areas in Israel. So there's another similarity with us that they, they even have sy sy symbology that's similar to what we have. Bauhaus Conference, May 1994, uh, uh, Tel Aviv, uh, uh, a conference was organized to look at the Bauhaus architecture. Now here's another coincidence, Barbara and I were in that hotel in May 1994 when this conference was going on, okay, by pure coincidence. Now I knew something about Bauhaus. I had read Tom Wolfe's book about 10 years earlier. I don't think I had any idea that there were Bauhaus in Tel Aviv, because nobody was talking about it. I mean, we went to Tel Aviv. This was my second trip to Israel, and Barbara's first at the time. And I don't think we, we even uh, considered Bauhaus, OK? And, and, and I remember looking at the exhibits and thinking, oh, that would be very interesting. But you know, we, we weren't invited. We're not on the list. And we're, we have, we have an, another agenda. But it was actually we were in the same hotel, okay? Another coincidence I read is that uh, Abe Resnick was at this conference, okay? And Abe Resnick was the owner of the New Yorker Hotel that was knocked down, okay? And one of the stories I tell on my tours is that uh, Abe Resnick said in 1994, this very same year, he said, I should have listened to Barbara. I would have made a lot of money if I didn't knock down the New Yorker Hotel. So it seemed that, you know, there may have been other influences. Uh, a resident was an observant Jew, and perhaps he wanted to support Israel as well. But I read in uh, Saving South Beach that he was at this conference. I may have been in the elevator with him. Okay. In 2003, uh, these buildings got a UNESCO designation as a World Heritage Site. But a World Heritage Site is like a designation uh, to be on the National Register of Historic Places. What it means is that people that have very good taste think that you also have very good taste. Okay. However, there's no uh, there's no funding to protect these buildings, and there's no legal structure. That's entirely up to the localities. So UNESCO is helpful in terms of recognition, uh, but it's it's just honorary. Goals of preservation. Well, I th I put together these goals, and I think they're probably pretty much generic goals that nobody everybody would agree with. You know, you want to preserve the most important buildings, you want to restore buildings as much as possible to their original appearances, you always want to improve a neighborhood. Uh, 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 preservationists always say and believe, and I think it's true, that preservation promotes economic uh, development, and you want to be very careful about what changes you're making in the neighborhood to try to promote uh, preservation. So these are what I would say are probably pretty much international goals. But Israel has some goals that are really quite uh, quite different, okay? One is that they want to avoid economic harm to the existing residents, okay? Now, one of the sad uh, side effects of preservation around the world 
is that they were usually displacement of local populations. I know Brooklyn, I grew up in Brooklyn, and at least 300,000 people have been forced out of Brooklyn in the last 10 years. Okay, and we're talking about low-income people, and, and Brooklyn was a good place for it. It had good, good public transportation, it had access to jobs, it had access to health care, and a lot of these people were being displaced to areas that don't have all of those. Even here in Miami Beach, we know you went a couple blocks from the beach. Barbara's original, Barbara Kaplan's original vision is that she thought that the hotels when they had economic activity here would be a source of employment for the poorer people that lived inland a couple of blocks, okay? But the reality is, is that as this neighborhood gentrified, the poorer people were, uh, were pushed out. Now another chip, uh, difference is that uh, uh, in Israel, they don't uh, preserve an entire district. They do have a district, uh, and there's a map of Tel Aviv over there, and if you take a look at it afterwards, you'll be able to see that there's a very broad area of buildings that are, of a neighborhoods that are slated for preservation, but not every building in that neighborhood is being uh, preserved. They're identifying specific buildings. Now they have some goals that you probably wouldn't, might seem very strange. Uh, Tel Aviv was built at, to a four-story level, not a very dense area for a major economic city today. So one of the goals that they want to do is they want to increase the economic uh, density. They want more housing on the existing land. They don't want to knock down the buildings that are there, but they want more density. Obviously, a city that was laid out, Tel Aviv was laid out in the 30s, is, uh, uh, Miami Beach was laid out in the 20s and 30s. These cities were not built for cars. We, we know what that had, the effect that it had here, and it's choking in Israel. They want to add parking. They also, when they add build, uh, renovate buildings, they want to add elevators, basements, and balconies, but they want to do it in a way that it's not obvious that they've done it. They want to do that toward the back of the building. Okay? Okay? And then they want to increase re resistance to earthquakes, and I'm not joking, this isn't a joke to rockets as well. Okay? And I can tell you that there's no place in Israel that isn't going to be under rocket attack at some time or another. Okay, my wife and I have had the occasion of waking up to the siren, and on one another occasion we were drinking uh, wine in our uh, living room, and my wife said, look at those stars shooting up, <laughs> except she realized they weren't stars, they were rockets. And uh, uh, every, every renovated building and every modern building in Israel since 1980 has a bomb shelter in the apartment. You have one room that has extra thick walls at 14 inches thick, uh, they have a steel door on it. They have a plate, a metal plate that closes against the window. And they have a vent hole for putting in a filter if you have a gas attack, except nobody knows where to get a gas filter. So uh, I've been trying to get a gas filter for our apartment for 15 years. Uh, I want to take a diversion and show you that the uh, program that renews uh, uh, historic buildings uh, I want to give you the context for what they're doing with buildings that are not historic, they're just ugly, the post-war buildings, okay? There's a program in Israel called Teva 38, and this is restoring the buildings that were built in the 50s, 60s, and up until the 1980s. There was a huge population growth at that time. They wanted to build uh, uh, buildings cheaply, and they were building them with no design aesthetic. Uh, they were actually copycat buildings. They just built the same building over and over again. Okay. However, Israel has certain advantages. Most of the apartments in Israel are owner-occupied. That's not an accident. The government has a, a, a number of policies so that even the poorest people can own their apartment. Okay. Uh, uh, the way in which these apartments are renovated is they provide development rights. Okay. Uh, a four-story building can be built up. Okay? The selling of those rights to a contractor is used to renovate the rest of the building. Okay? When these buildings are renovated, the value of the apartment goes up 50%. So you would end up with a win-win situation. In other words, the person who owns that apartment, who's living in that apartment, they're not forced to move, but if they participate in this renovation program, the value of their apartment goes up. However, these are not uh, homesteaders. They're allowed and encouraged to relocate because one of the reasons Israel doesn't want to have a lot of public housing is that when people have cheap housing, they don't want to move. So you end up with the situation where a single widow is in a three-bedroom house, okay, okay, and a young family can't move in. 
Uh, what Israel wants is that if you're in that three bedroom house and you want to sell it and you can get good money for it, maybe you want to go live near where your children live in a different city, sell your house and let somebody move in who, who needs that piece of property, okay? Uh, gentrification is slow. It doesn't end, but it's going at a pace that people are controlling, not, uh, uh, not developers, okay? And of course it has the effect of increasing housing stock. These are pictures from Ashdod. Okay, but they give you an idea. This is a building, I guess it was built in the 60s, pretty ugly. Inside it's not bad, by the way. The apartments could be pretty nice. Okay, but you can see not a whole lot of effort went into building the outside of this building. Okay, uh, uh, the a contractor comes in, makes a deal, we're gonna make a series of improvements. The law stipulates what the minimum package is. You have to put in an elevator, you have to uh, strengthen the building against earthquakes, you have to put in a bomb shelter, you have to put in a balcony. There's a, a package that's required by law as a minimum uh, improvement. A whole structure is built around the building, okay? A whole building is around the building, okay? And when they're done, it looks something like that. So you have a building that doesn't look, now you notice you kind of, it's actually now a six-story building, okay? It might be six and a half because the first floor, which originally had no apartments, it was just a breezeway, sometimes they had some garden apartments down there as well. So you can see that the building looks nicer, housing has been added, and no one has been displaced unless they want to sell their apartment and move. So how does this affect preservation? In Tel Aviv, there's a law, 2650B. Okay, in Tel Aviv, there are 4,000 buildings that are pre-World War II. Originally 1,000, now 2,000 have been identified for preservation. So half the buildings are not trying to preserve at all. They've just said, the, the owners, you're free to do whatever you want with that building. Okay, put lots together, put up skyscrapers. Of course, there were building codes, there were review boards, but they're not, there's no desire or attempt to uh, preserve them. Remember that one of their goals is they want to increase the density. So they're gonna do it in various ways. One way is to free up some of the land, the other way is to permit the existing buildings to build up. Of the 4,000 buildings, 200 have been designated for strict preservation. That means it's got to look like it did on the day that it was built. 200 out of 4,000, okay? I'm not saying this is right, I'm not saying it's wrong, I'm just telling you what it is, it's different. It's what the values of this society are and what people are in agreement, okay? Again, you have development rights. Now, if you're in one of those buildings that's strict, uh, preservation and you can't build up, you can sell your rights to another builder who can add those to a different building. So even the building that is identified for strict preservation has an income potential or a cash potential by selling its development rights to a developer who's going to apply them to another building. So even that building has a way of, of accessing some cash, okay? And then finally, there's an architectural office that reviews changes and additions, much like we have in, in, uh, in Miami. They, they, have, uh, they want this process to go ahead, but it can't go ahead uh, uh, uncontrolled. It has to be managed, okay? So what do you end up with? You end up with five ways to renovate a building in Tel Aviv. One, you can have strict conservation, no change, your development rights have been sold. Two, you can add floors in the same style. So if you looked at it, unless you knew that it was a four-story building, you wouldn't be able to tell. You can add floors in a different style. You can have a uh, roof setback. They have the same rule that we have here, that if you're standing on the curb and you can't see the change, it doesn't count as an addition, okay? You, can, if, if, you have to see it from the curb in front of the building, very similar to, uh, to what we do here, okay? This building has been designated for strict preservation, Okay, and except for the fact that they got a rooftop garden, there's, you know, which is allowable, there's nothing, every, everything about this building is supposed to look like it did uh, on the day that it, uh, that it was built. I can see they have some new windows going in, but uh, other than that, it's uh, an original building. Now here's a building that was originally a four-story building. This was the very first picture I took, okay? Uh, and you can see two stories were added, and they were added in even different styles. The fifth floor has got like a big ribbon window, and then the sixth floor has a recessed balcony. Okay? So here, you look at that building, you know immediately. It was a four-story building, they added two stories. Okay? Again, subject to a review process, but they were allowed to do it. Okay? Now here's a building in which the floors were added in the same style. Unless you did a count, you wouldn't know that uh, 
that flaws were added because they just added them on in the same style. Again, this was done with permission of the uh, review board. And if you notice also, these buildings, like some of the other buildings we saw, they don't have, uh, the balconies are no longer enclosed, okay? Uh, some of the buildings that we looked at, I didn't point it out to you, they added air conditioners by bolting them to the side of the building. And what could be uglier than a, a, a compressor bolted to the side of a, a, a Bauhaus building, okay? So these buildings, okay, a lot of what you're now seeing is what's behind the building. The air conditioners are behind the building. The elevator is behind the building. Okay, a lot has been added to this building. You're not seeing it because you're not supposed to see it. Okay, and they won't allow you to see it in the plan. So this building, okay, they added floors, but other than that, the appearance is similar to what it was when it opened. Now here's the building with the setback. Now I took this from across the street, but if I were standing over here on the sidewalk, you would not be able to see that addition. So that's very similar to what we have here. So this is a building that has a, a setback, and therefore they were able to add uh, some additions to it. Now here's the building, here's an interesting building, kind of looks like Haddon Hall, doesn't it? Yeah. Okay, and then an uncanny. I once had a tour group of some uh, Jewish students, and then I figured they'd probably all been to Israel. So I showed them this building, and I showed them a picture of Haddon Hall. So I said, which one do you think is in Israel? Can you guess? So one smart kid said, well, that one there, it's American cars, okay? Okay, but the building itself is very, very simple. But notice what they did here, okay? This is, there's a tower added to this building, a whole tower has been added to it, okay? Okay, so somebody, somewhat reminiscent of what they're talking about doing in, uh, on the terrace, I think, okay? I think they're talking about uh, putting in some towers and setting them back a bit, but uh, preserving the facade in the front of the building, okay? so. So basically, the lobby gets extended and a whole tower was added on uh, to, this, to, this, uh, to these buildings. Okay, I'm just gonna show you now. This is a building we saw earlier. Look at how nice that looks at night. Okay, isn't that beautiful? Okay, uh, here's that other building. This is the one with the two floors added. When these buildings are lit up at night, they're very, very attractive to lit up uh, properly. Okay, so this ends the uh, presentation. I'm just going to show you three things quickly, okay? I'm going to show you three things that I think you'll only see in Israel. This is first, okay? <laughs> this is not a cross-dressing Hasidic Jew, by the way. Okay, this is an illusion. He simply is standing by an advertisement. But it has the illusion of being a cross-dressing Hasidic Jew, okay? Another thing that you'll see is uh, 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 military soldiers that are in uh, military units, combat units, including women, have to carry their weapons with them 24 hours a day. So you will see women carrying uh, uh, weapons like that. This picture, I think, is probably set up. That gun is loaded. She could actually go to jail for carrying a loaded gun. She's not allowed to carry the gun loaded. That clip is not supposed to be in there. But, and but, by the way, and most of the soldiers don't want that clip. Okay? And finally, okay, you will see, not so much in Tel Aviv, I, I don't think I've ever seen a camel in Tel Aviv, but I have seen them in Jerusalem, and I'm talking about working camels. I'm talking about people that are using them for, for transportation. But this is so funny because the camel is sitting in the parking lot, and I don't know if you can see the, uh, the, the, the heading on the bottom, it says camel lot. Okay, thank you. Joel, that was great. So, do we have any questions from the audience? Yes. Did you meet any of the people involved in the preservation effort over there, and were they yes, sort of I, like I, grassroots I, folks like here? Uh, I met with the director of the Bauhaus Center. Okay. Uh, uh, and my goal with him was really to find out. Uh, well, let me back up and tell you. I have a working knowledge of Hebrew. I can read Hebrew. Okay, so I did research in Hebrew, but sometimes there are things that are between the lines, okay, that you can't always get in a law. I have uh, over there a copy of the law. So what I wanted to do was, was find out uh, what are the motivations. So some of that information, for example, where I'm talking about the goals, the goals of the society, how the goals of the society uh, uh, are different and how they're, they're playing out. Okay, so we had a whole discussion about how Teva 38 and 4650B, how they're related, how they're two sides of the same coin, and that's why I decided to, uh, to do it. So yes, uh, uh, the director of their center, okay, uh, 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 
uh, has uh, the same kind of role that we have here. It's an advocacy and it's an education role. Okay, and he was very helpful in trying to understand some of the subtleties of, uh, of that culture. What are the controversial preservation issues over there? Oh, that's an interesting question. Uh, well, uh, one, one question uh, that, that, that's bothering people is there are people that would like to uh, stop increasing the density of Tel Aviv, okay? Uh, uh, the problem with that is that uh, everybody complains. Well, let me back up and tell you the kind of conversations I have with friends in Israel, okay? People tell me, it's not fair, okay? Uh, my son can't afford to live in Tel Aviv, okay? And I tell people, you know what? It's not fair, I can't afford to live in Manhattan, okay? When you have a, an inner city, and I don't mean an inner city in the slum sense, I mean an inner city in the development sense, okay? Uh, uh, the center of a, of a country, Okay, uh, you have a situation where people are going to be priced out. Okay, okay. So when I say there's no gentrification or that it's slowed down, if you're the if you're an elderly person and you have this apartment and all of a sudden it's worth a million dollars, you're rich or relatively wealthy, you give that money to your children, but the average person is being priced out of that market. Okay, and that's controversial because people feel this country had a semi-socialist. Uh, it would be a, a, a background. It had a, a, a background of, uh, of uh, less extremes in the social uh, milieu. They've had, since the founding of Israel, they've had uh, a, a single-payer health care system. No. Nobody even debates it, okay? No. I, okay? They don't understand it, but they don't debate it. When they say they don't understand it, uh, the way it works is everybody has a payroll tax, that goes, you then have four health groups that you can join, they compete on service, okay? Uh, uh, and they all do a pretty good job, okay? And they don't understand a society like the United States where, 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 uh, where you know, people don't have health. I would tell people sometimes, before we had Obamacare, that there were seven Israels of uninsured people in the United States. And they say, well, why don't they just go to the doctor? It costs two dollars, because it costs them two dollars. They say, it doesn't cost two dollars. I remember telling somebody it costs a thousand dollars when you have tests. And they, they say, it can't cost a dollar, a thousand dollars. I go to the doctor for two dollars. So they don't have the same sense of economic reality because they've been buffered from it. So now, they want to, their kids want to move to Tel Aviv, and they find out that an apartment is a million dollars. And they say, well, that's not fair, okay? Why should Tel Aviv only be for millionaires? Okay, and I would say that that's very controversial. Okay, people are moving to suburbs. Ashdod, where we have an apartment, is a suburb. Okay, it take, you can take a train uh, into Tel Aviv in 30 minutes. And I, I, I live and work, and my wife and I in Huntington, Long Island, commuting on an hour train. 30 minutes to me seems like a good deal. But to an Israeli who's not used to that, uh, that says, well, why should we have to live in the boondocks? I should be able to live in the center of the country. Yes. I just wanted to point out the irony or the coincidence that the building that replaced your Penn Station building looks exactly like the international style building that's on top of Grand Central. That, well, it's, it's I mean, sort of the like same period. So and remember, they're only two years apart. Okay? Because Penn Station, I think, is 64. And that actually, I think, was built in 62. I think I said 64, but it's actually 62. So you're talking about exactly the same thing happening 6,000 miles away. And they were building in the same style. You're absolutely right. It does, it, it, it's the same, you know? And I have to tell you, too, I remember as a child, I was about 10 years old. I, I, I should be ashamed to say that in this room. I remember thinking, what do people care about some crummy old building for? They're going to put up a nice new building, how great that's going to be. Okay, that's what I thought when I was 10 years old. Now I realize what was lost. Uh, uh, but they had the same struggle in the culture. That's why I called it, that term, Penn, Penn, uh, Penn yeah. Yeah. It was my term, because I've never heard anybody use it. But people say that's the building that changed the way people think. All right, maybe one more, and then if anyone wants to ask questions after, we can do that too. Uh, my, my question is in regards uh, to the color. In uh, uh, Germany, in Bauhaus, white is the color. In Tel Aviv, is that something that influenced Bau the Bauhaus, uh, German Bauhaus, oh. influenced it? Or oh no, these buildings were built consciously in the Bauhaus style. 
okay? That when I said that they, that they weren't trained in the Bauhaus school, that doesn't mean they weren't built in the Bauhaus style. They were built in the Bauhaus style. They, 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 they took the color, they took the shape, okay? I simply wanted to make the point the architects were not actually refugees, okay? Yeah, yeah. This was already a decision that people were making in the country to build in that style, because they wanted to build in the modern style of their time. And also, that this was, you know, the Bauhaus, remember the original purpose of the Bauhaus, 1918, was to build inexpensive houses for workers. Mm -hmm. Tel Aviv was a city of inexpensive houses for workers. That's what this was. It was all, this was a very working class city in 1930 or 35, and the exact goals of the Bauhaus is what they wanted, okay? Uh, whether it was exactly white, some people say, well, you know, the original color was like a little more off-white, okay? Uh, and now, they had, because, you know, it, it, it had a, like a cement front, and the cement front uh, yellows a little bit, so, but I don't think anybody wants to call themselves the yellow city. So, so they use the term the white city, and so now they actually paint it white because they want that bright whiteness. They want, they want that connection with the Bauhaus. And if you notice, that building was called the Bauhaus Center. That's what it was called, the Bauhaus Center. All right, great. Well, thank, thank you again. You.